Uh, welcome, everyone, to Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the Apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop roleplay games using or inspired by the Apocalypse Engine. I'm your MC today, Rach, and I'm joined by my co MC, Rich. Hey, Rich, how's your Gauntlet Con been going? My Gauntlet Con early on, I had to work on uh, Thursday, but I got to play a game Thursday evening, which was really fun. And this morning I ran, hit the streets to fend the block, just finished up a panel with you on GMing PBTA. So it is hot and heavy. Your Gauntlet Con, how's it going? Uh, mostly okay. I had a bit of a outside of Gotlacon issue and I had to cancel my game for yesterday, but I'm super hyped for my Golden Sky Stories game, uh, tomorrow night. And that's going to be really exciting. So apologies for anyone who has signed up for Thursday. It was kind of beyond my control. Uh, and yeah, this is a yesterday's panel. Uh, last hour's panel was <laughs> amazing. And, uh, once you're done listening to this live stream, you should turn around and go listen to me, Phil and, uh, Marissa, talk about how to uh, GM Powered by the Apocalypse games, uh, moderated by Rich. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, I learned a good n number of things. I'm so excited to have that in my YouTube feed so I can go back and watch it again when I'm not stressed out and trying to moderate a panel and I can just listen to all the goodness. Mm -hmm. So this is our first live episode. I'll peel back the curtain to let you know that often Plus One Forward is a heavily edited show. If you hear ums and uhs that you never heard before, I blame the lack of editing. <laughs> Random airplanes. I'm on a flight path. Occasionally we get buzzed while recording, so that might happen. Be excited. <laughs> exactly. So we are going to run uh, this particular episode. It's kind of like two mini episodes stuck in one. These are the kind of things that might not have made a full episode, but we're live now. So we're fully committed to doing these things. Why don't you kick us off with the first topic? Fabulous. So we talk a lot on Plus One Forward about past game experiences and what we can learn from them and how they relate to topics that we decide to focus on. We don't really spotlight games that are currently going on or games we're currently involved with a lot. So I want to take a little bit of time for Rich and I to discuss what games we've been playing or are currently playing and how we feel about them. Because these aren't the necessarily going to be the old standbys of the Powered by the Apocalypse community. This is going to be some newer stuff that might not have made it into rotation in terms of discussion. So, uh, Rich, what have you been playing? A lot. Uh, a, a whole lot. So, to talk more specifically... I have actually pared back on the, my play by post activity. I know I've talked about it from time to time on the plus one forward show that I'm, I always have some kind of um, play by post going on right now. I'm down to just a couple that are still out there. One is a monster hearts game that started before there was a demigods powered by the apocalypse game. Honestly, if we were to start it now, it probably would be a demigods game because it started with the character in the first season uh, her name's Jules. It's a solo game, so it's just me and my buddy Heidi playing. Jules was an infernal, and as she discovered more about her dark power, she found out that it was Erato, the muse of love poetry. And uh, and now in second season, she is playing the face skin, or she switched playbooks to the face skin, and uh, and the instead of it being like fairies, it's it's Greek themed, so she's the chosen of Zeus, and uh, there's a whole lot of like high school hijinks mixed with gods walking the earth. Uh, Aphrodite just showed up, and they locked her in the field house. It's crazy. Uh, but hey, Aphrodite did tame the Nemean lion, so that's that's nice too. So Lansing Lions, it's the name of the high school, so they pulled that off. Uh, uh, kind of faking. Let's go back. You said chosen. Are you using the chosen playbook or what playbook? Uh, great question. Yeah, it's a, it's a thing I do where I use words that mean other things. <laughs> no, um, it's, it's she's playing a fae. And the the excuse for the Fae is that it's not a Fae with fairies going into fairyland. It's uh, a Fae skin, but she is in actuality 
serving the Olympian gods and Zeus has chosen her because before the dark power of Verato had chosen jewels. And so that we just kind of carried that forward. The, I know there's a chosen skin, uh, but it's, it's really, she's just straight up playing a fae. Uh, but the, the fae, when they go to, you know, I, I can't remember what it is, but it's the through the looking glass. No, 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 that's a bedlam thing. But the power where you can go to the fairy, take people across, she could take people to Mount Olympus and, and talk with those gods. I, I've just given a little space to that because I, I know well, I've played a lot of urban fantasy games and therefore a lot of monster hearts. How is the Fae holding up in a one-on-one -on -one game? Because they seem very socially positioned to grab a lot of strings on other players and there aren't any other players. There aren't any other players. And if I were to show you on Tavern Keeper, the litany of strings that Jules has and the fact that Heidi has chosen to take unashamed as well as claws out moves, which gives strings for bonuses to rolls, the number of strings that NPCs have on her. It's crazy bananas. Uh, there are so many strings that there, it just goes on and on and on. All of the string, it's a litany. It's crazy. Yeah, that's a thing. I wouldn't call it a problem, but like it's a problem. <laughs> and PC bloat happens. <laughs> but Hi Heidi's well organized, and I just kind of leave it to her. And every once in a while, I'll be like, "There, NPC has four strings on her. I'm going to have that person have a problem and make a demand of her and spend a string, because why not?" Um, the other play by post game that I'm in is uh, was a Monster Hearts game a few years ago. And one of the players uh, left the game but wanted to keep playing, so it became a Monster of the Week game uh, that I'm running solo. However, just recently, as of like a month ago, a player who was in the Monster Hearts game has remade her character as a Monster of the Week character and is showing up as a guest star. So it's like this weird backdoor sequel pilot thing going on. It's hilarious. That's amazing. Yeah, and uh, don't tell Jen or Tara, but uh, they may be going to Hawaii and may have a crossover with some NPCs that were from the Jewels game because I'm weird that way in pocket universes and uh, in, in that game interstitial that I saw on the schedule for uh, for Gauntlet Con, I was like, oh my god, I must I must play that game sometime. That looks so cool. Interstitial is a game where it's like fan fictions crossover. Uh, so it's kind of the inspired by the, uh, oh shoot, what is the, the, it's, the it's Kingdom Hearts, isn't it? Kingdom, yes. Yeah, it's, it's like Kingdom Hearts, the RPG. Totally I, that. I uh, definitely need to get a copy of that for reasons we'll discuss later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those are the two power uh, play by post games that I, I still have going on. There's an Apocalypse World one that may be starting, but we'll, we'll see how that's going. Online, I just finished up a three session run in my Star Wars Saturdays campaign. Um, which where I just switch out different games that I'm running every month. And this one is a hack of night witches. Now, um, I normally like to play games rules as written before I do any tweaking to them. Um, but this one I didn't. And I will say I've watched a number of Night Witches sessions. Jim Crocker has an ongoing series of it that's really fascinating. He's doing a great job running it and has taught me so much. Uh, but I hacked it to Star Wars because I'm just fascinated with the idea behind Night Witches. But I was I like I'm not very good at history games. I get hives. I get nervous. Like I'm doing it wrong. And I've read the book. Jason's Morningstar, who wrote Night Witches, is great at making it welcoming and making sure you don't have to get it all right. This is in the spirit of it here. The and, and he does a great job of laying out the duty stations to walk you through stuff. I still just like, I just want to put it in Star Wars. So I did. And tonally, it was a little different because in Night Witches, you've got a really good solid frame. You're playing Russian bomber pilots who the Russian male dominated army don't want to succeed, but I have just the um, amount of temerity and tenacity to do so uh, at a, at a great cost and uh, body counts are high in night witches. And it definitely mapped over to the star Wars game that I ran. Um, I really just tweaked around names of things to make them uh, less Russian, uh, less airplanes, um, less, specifically around the uh, sexism bent of, mm -hmm. uh, of of Night Witches. And the frame that I took to it is to have 
instead of it like men working against women, I tilted the frame with their rebel pilots who are flying old Clone Wars era. That's like 30 plus years old stuff. Uh, y wings. And the the push on them or the the uh, the thing that hurt was that they um, there was an imperial like command that turned coat and they're the ones that they have to work their regiment works and attachment to. So it's a whole bunch of humans and all the player characters were alien species, right? So we had Nautilus and Mon Calamari and probably a bunch of names that people who don't give two rats butts about star Wars don't care about, but just imagine a bunch of aliens. And so we had kind of a speciesism that was the, uh, the main pain point for them. And, and, uh, and that was, that was interesting but tonally it's it was it was it had less grit to it you know yeah that's interesting because i think uh the species is um that's like a pretty old standby for star wars stories at least like back in the the old expanded universe i remember that being a thing all the time <laughs> yeah it felt like something that i could get some traction with and the players enjoyed it but i think the only time that i really kind of hit that night witch's tone with it with when one of uh, when they came back from a mission and one of them was injured and so they went looking for a med bay on station where they were training and they found that that the med bay did not have because it was retrofitted from imperials it didn't have xenobiology programmed in so the oh, shit. they couldn't get healed and that was a nice moment like that smack you in the face moment of like yeah this this world isn't set up for you to succeed um that one was good um and the rules for running missions was great. Uh, that mapped over incredibly well. So I quite enjoyed it. I've got some tweaks in mind, and I'll probably want to bring it back next year in Star Wars Saturdays again with a slightly refreshed uh, look. And I may actually lean into the lighter tone, um, but still a high body count because Star Wars has an incredibly high body count if you pay attention. <laughs> well, I mean... Even going back to like the X-Wings novels, even going back to the novelization of the first movie, the uh, Death Star run is pretty horrific. There's uh, some moments in the book where you're like, and then you see from the point of view of this character, and now they're dead. And mm -hmm. this character's dead. And uh, I read it once on a plane, and we went through turbulence, and I had to put it down because I'm like, this is too real right now. Like, I can't read about any more pilots dying. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh yeah, so let me jump ahead. Sorry, I've got a lot. If you want to jump in at any point, Ray, should talk about more interesting things. I'll just keep going my list until you no, do. No, let's go for your list. We have an hour to fill, and we're at, what, 12 minutes? Let's oh talk about your game stories. <laughs> we, I, we have 30 minutes, and then we're going to talk about our second topic. Oh, our second topic is so exciting. So Nawal is a game that I just finished up a four-session run of. That is uh, Miguel Espinosa's Mexican monster and angel hunting game. It is spectacular. This game is so tight. Um, I, I really love Noel. I want to run it more. I, I, the group that uh, I got the pleasure to play with was fantastic. It was just, it's a really, really good game. It's, I'm realizing with it that um, it's to me, Noel. And I didn't realize this until I kind of pitched it to a couple of other groups to kind of keep playing Nawal when to keep that treadmill yeah. going. So in Nawal, you play these people who put on masks uh, that allow them to summon forth their animal totem. And they are descended from shamans. And in the history of Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the Nawal world, the conquistadores came to the new world and they brought their angels and their gods and their angels hunted down all of the ancient shamans and and now we're in the modern day and there are angels here but they are invisible creatures that kind of feed on people's faith and beliefs and the nawal are coming back and they hunt those angels and not only do they hunt those angels and this is the part that to me really makes it stand apart from a monster of the week game where monster of the week is it's not murder hobo but it's like vagrant mystery solver monster killers there's a little bit of murder hobo is in there like a little bit of traveling people who do murder things for money 
Right. So the thing that tilts in Nawal is that you don't just hunt these angels down. You now, you all, you, the pack, the, the team, the group of PCs have a business where you go and butcher these angels and and you butcher these angels to things, to product that you sell to people like Grigri and, uh, and you can actually have a Takarita and you can take angel meat and like sell angel meat and it has magical properties. And so there's this weird, cool, magical realism, supernatural flavor that you have in the setting that I just, I find it absolutely fascinating. The, um, the setting's like quite deep because it's based off a comic series, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, when I spoke with the author. Yeah, yeah, it's based off a comic series and series of short stories. And let me just tell you, if you want to get a vibe on it, the number one best source, other than there's a heavy metal issue, heavy metal magazine issue that has some incredible art from Clement, uh, who uh, is the guy that created it. There is a TV series on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix Canada or not. It's called Diablero. No, so it, I believe it is. I think it popped up uh, a few weeks ago. Holy crap, it's great. I um, haven't watched it yet. I've, I've just been hearing people talk about it going like, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> it is super good. And it's a great touchstone. Um, Diablero is slightly different, but it's close enough to where you can get all that you need to run a pretty good Diablero game. You're not hunting angels in Diablero. The characters are hunting demons. Um, but the idea that those demons are kind of known but ignored by the the genteel populace but the the lower echelon the lower class and lower caste they truck with it on a day-to-day -day basis is part of the business of a diablero to kind of make money by selling type one or type two demons that they've caught and captured it's right there and it's really really fun um that's a super good show and uh and i i even don't mind the dubbing on it so you should check it out I'm hoping that show does make uh, the game a little bit more accessible because I found some of the the cultural aspects are presenting barriers that should not be, be barriers, but are basically acting as barriers where people are like, oh, this doesn't this is a little bit too different for what I'm used to. And I'm not sure what to do with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. And I, and that's actually the part that I'm starting to realize is a little bit of a challenge. I pitched it to two different groups. And one of the players from a group was like, I'm playing an angel in a game right now, and I just don't know if I have the headspace for playing angel hunters. And these angels in this in this setting are very they're they're gross. And most of them are not even like sentient. They're just kind of monstrous things. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I get that. And maybe we can check back in six, nine months and see if that, that player's ready. The other group had a concern. Um, one of the players had a concern of like you know, I, I don't know if I like the anti-religious bent of this. And they asked if we could, you know, hack it. And I I said no, even though I hack stuff all the time, um, for a couple of reasons. The first one is like this game's still in playtest, it's still in development, and and like I have a drive to like help in any way I can to like run the crap out of it and and uh, run it rules as written versus my normal hacking bit. The other one is there's something that's really interesting about expressing the culture that Miguel and, and Clement, you know, who created the world are doing that. I don't know. I like, I see it as art and I don't want to mess with it. I think, um, and this is me sort of signposting. I am a white Canadian. I think it's like a discussion about colonialism and religion is one of those aspects of colonialism in this game. So to take those religious components out of the game, is taking one of its themes away. Yeah, but I felt weird because I, like, I just hacked Night Witches for Star Wars, right? Where do I get on my high horse to do this? But there's it, it, just a thing where I, I decided, you know what, that's cool. Let's just play a different game and that group will play a different game. And that's that's fine. I didn't get upset about mm -hmm. it. It wasn't a heated conversation in any way. Like to me, I just considered it an X card and we just move on. Mm -hmm. But it was a thought that I had of like, well, why don't I hack this? And, and, and I've really tried to give it some some good hard think uh but but yeah we we're playing something else we're going to be starting a game of bite marks uh bite marks is the werewolf game from becky anison and black armada games 
um, it is almost done. Like the uh, the game was Bite Me on Kickstarter, and she sent it off to Layout, and and it's renamed the game because it turned out there's like a kids card game that also is named Bite Me. So she's renamed it Bite Marks. If you're wondering what are some touchstones, the Canadian sci-fi show Bitten is a great touchstone for bite marks if you have haven't watched i saw that on sci-fi back in the day and it's on netflix here as well have you heard that i have i just learned from you that it was a tv show but i have read some of kelly armstrong's books which the tv show is based off of uh the first one i remember quite vividly because there was where there were werewolves running around the don valley and that was a pretty cool aesthetic and i think they were based out of upstate new york it was a whole thing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm super excited about this. The characters that we did with the character creations, all that we've done. And now we're about to get by holidays. So I'm a little worried about what are those like the dearth of games is when you go into the November, December time frame, you know, I've oh, lost I so, feel many, you. <laughs> so many campaigns when Christmas time, when the holiday season comes, it's when campaigns go to die. But uh, I just Thank God for doodle.com. You know, that scheduling is just the best. It saves you 50, 60 emails. Um, and and so everybody's put in their times, and I think we're going to be able to sneak in a couple sessions in November and carry it through to December. So I'm excited about bite marks. Um, other stuff that's going on for me, I'm running uh, a hacked monster hearts for the Gauntlet comic setting. I called it Super Juvie. I will say while I'm having a good time, I uh, I consider this hack probably not the best idea I've had in a long time. Like sometimes when you do experimental, try to shove uh, chocolate into peanut butter, not always is it the best tasting Reese cup. Like this one was maybe a fast break. I don't know if you've ever read that or had that uh, particular abomination from uh, Reese's, but uh, I remember fast break. I have eaten yeah, a lot of American candy. <laughs> it's not great. Um, it's too many layers. Uh, I the core concept of Monster Hearts is a very elegant and simple approach to emulating supernatural teen kind of sadness, <laughs> tragedy. And I not only layered in, let's put it in a juvenile hall, which probably would have worked, but I then layered in and they're super, they're super powered beings because I wanted to stick it in a gauntlet comics milieu uh, living campaign. And I think it was just too much. Like we've done a little bit of hacking on the side. To, I took the um, Unleash Your Powers from Masks and I made a custom move called Unleash Your Dark Powers and you would roll with dark. And you had similar results to that except you could take on like conditions and stuff. And it works okay, but like there's just there's just too much going on. Um, and I'm a little disappointed that I, I that it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work as well. Like it's a good enough group to where we're making it work. Like they are telling interesting stories, but the monstrosity that I have forced them into from a mechanical standpoint is not helping matters. Uh, so th- that's a thing, but it's a it's a learning thing, and and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would take it. A t- my takeaway from that would be you know live and learn this might not be the right combination of games. I mean, like we hack and fiddle with Powered by the Apocalypse games all the time, and sometimes just completely fall apart or blow up in our faces. Those are not good times. No, this one didn't blow up in my face. Uh, and it's big. It's it's big in, in, in most, most of the reason that it's good is that this player, this cast group, uh, uh, players, uh, Peter, Leandro, Misha, Joe have all been just superb and really fun to play with. And they've, they're really interested in their characters and that kind of carries through most games, honestly. Uh, I'm running Project Lycra, which is Jen Kitzman's game. Jen, we had on on the uh, Custom Moves Make the Game episode way back in the day. Jen, good buddy of mine. This is a game she's been working on for a while. Um, it is a Powered by the Apocalypse answer to, I love masks, a new generation, but I don't always want to play young adults or teenagers. That's what the germination of Project Lycra uh, was. It's grown and evolved to become something uh 
much more interesting and uh, and and well developed than just let's take the masks grown up moves and start with that. Uh, but I I really like Project Lycra. It is a super fun supers game to run. Some grown up masks with feels is the elevator pitch, but there's a lot more going on, and um, I, I just I really like it. I'm really interested in seeing where that game goes because you've talked about it in the past so passionately and the idea of having an adult game that explores evolving complicated emotions is also very interesting because I find we put that uh, in teenage gaming a lot with Powered by the Apocalypse because of Monster Arts and Mask. They're the two big examples I can think of. But beyond that, thing, things get a little bit more gray or oftentimes I think of like emotional play in the type the style of urban shadows, which I love, but it's like, do you make the good choice or do you go into corruption? And it's very black and white. And it's not so much about holding and exploring emotions. Yeah. I, I think Jen's bent on this. Number one comes from a deep comic knowledge. She, she worked at a comic book stop, a uh, comic book store for like 10 plus years, still reads comics, loves comics. She's created 10 playbooks. She has playbook eyes uh, characters from comics from like, I don't know how I'd do that. And, uh, and then you just hand it to Jen. She's like, put a pencil in her ear. She's like, gets it down and just workshops the crap out of it. And I'm like, damn, the pledge bear is amazing. How did you do that? Uh, it's, it's a super good game. And we're actually running it on Sundays. Jen's in the game. And this is the intercontinental group of awesome that I play with. And we're, we played masks earlier this year. Uh, in the Halcyon City Herald collection setting. So in Halcyon City, and we just aged up several of the characters and NPCs and, and poured them into playbooks and Project Lycra. And it's, it's perfect. It's really good. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and then uh, I'll quickly go through the last ones, um, uh, which are Zombie World. I don't get tired of Zombie World. I'm running it on Sunday. If you haven't played Zombie World, you should check it out. It's an amazing game. The Roll20 uh, campaign frame for it is pretty darn good. I really like Zombie World. I think uh, I was looking on Slack where someone got the opportunity to play it earlier today, and they said it was one of the best games they've played in a while, so that's always good to hear. Zombie World is just great. I love Walking Dead. I'm not tired of it. I think this season's amazing. Like, I really love this season of The Walking Dead right now. And being able to run uh, Zombie World is just a pleasure. It's The cards are so great at kicking fiction right in your face and making hard choices and being scary. And I'm not good with scary. Like, I don't run scary games. But hot damn, I can run a pretty horrific Zombie World game, he says. And then Sunday is going to be terrible because he said well that. I think Magpie Games in particular, uh, Zombie World and Bluebeard's Bride, uh, are very good at providing support tools for making creepy games creepier and helping guide you through that process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's good. That's good. Um, and so, SL, I hear you. I hear you about Walking Dead past season three. I, I liked it all the way up to the point with a long interminable war that happened. Um, but there's a new person who's in charge of it for the last two seasons. They've really recovered it. They moved it forward and the, and the culture and the community has changed. And it's just oh, it's so good. So good. I'll, I'll shut up. I'll shut up. Cause it's not a walking dead cast. Um, and I probably wouldn't pull that off very good. That's, that's my stuff. That's what I'm playing. Rach, what are you playing? All right. So I've got uh, two categories of games. I've got one shots and I have some home games and I have two of each to talk about. Uh, for my one shots, uh, if people are curious, I do run Powered by the Apocalypse games one shots in the Toronto area. Usually I do it through Toronto Area Gamers Monthly Meetup. So if you are in Southern Ontario and you want to haul out to Toronto and play some Powered by the Apocalypse, I will not be running anything in November because I will actually be in Japan during Monthly Meetup, but maybe December, maybe January. Uh, the last two months, though, uh, back in September, I ran Escape from Dino Island. And, oh, my God, I had the worst players ever in that they were beautiful, but they were terrible people making terrible decisions. Uh, Escape from Dino Island is a one or two shot powered by the apocalypse game inspired by science run amok uh, stories like 
big door stopper airport novels like Jurassic Park and similar. Jurassic Park's the best touch, uh, touchstone I can think of for this type of story. So you do have an island. It's full of dinosaurs. The specifics are generated randomly at the table. And then you figure out why your characters are going to this island. Uh, they were all going to this island to go steal a dinosaur egg to become millionaires. What I like about this game is there's a mechanic where to trigger downtime moves, you are encouraged to tell a story and your playbook has several prompts that relate to what your playbook is about. So the hunter will tell a story about their hunting excursions. The paleontologist will tell a story about their uh, research and their archaeological digs. Through the tell a story moves, we ended up discovering that the reason why all these terrible criminals were going to steal a dino egg is they were all deeply in love with the party's paleontologist and really just wanted him to be happy. And that was the pathway to hell. <laughs> like, these were terrible people. They strapped a bomb to a child at one point because they thought yeah. it was a good idea. Like, it, this, they were bad people making bad decisions, but it was an interesting framework for that kind of story. Highly recommend uh, checking it out. It is was part of the Zine Quest uh, Kickstarter campaign back in February, and I believe it's completely out of published. We have a plus one forward episode in November where I interview Sam and Sam, who talk about the game. The other game I ran... Uh, what, I'm sorry, I, I'm I sorry. have a question. No, I'm just sure. I'm excited to... So Escape from Dino Island, is it supposed like is it supposed to be goofy all the time? It has it's not supposed to be goofy. The strapping a bomb to a child situation was not essentially goofy. It did wiggle a little bit goofy in that we had someone who was stuck on the island who thought they were a dinosaur, and how we got to that position is a long sort of tale we don't have time for here. I say rolling my eyes. Um I think it can lean a little bit more pulpy in the way that if you go back and watch Jurassic Park now, that movie's pretty goofy. <laughs> it's not what I I, I I think it's legit to hold on to your butts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and having, uh, oh God, Jeff Goldblum walking around being shirtless and sexy. I mean, like that has no place in a serious movie. <laughs> All right, I'll let you move on. I just the had freezers that. have blown. We need to eat all the ice cream. <laughs> uh, so not supposed to be goofy. I let it roll a little goofy. It was a one shot. Going back to what we did in October, so something that will be on the top of everyone's minds, we played the recently kickstarted game Root. Uh, Rich, have you played Root yet? I got to play Root at Origins, but I was sworn to secrecy. Now that the Kickstarter's out, I can talk about it. Hot damn, that's a good game. Oh, it's it's a it's a sexy game. Uh, I've heard a lot of people describing it as Dungeon World 2.0. I don't think it is. I think it's a very interesting, different way to look at fantasy role playing, in that especially in how you're positioned in the story, where you are a force of change, but you're also beholden to other people because you don't have enough social sway to be your own faction. That's kind of complicated and interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think the faction level stuff is fascinating. I like the different um, tracks for like fatigue and harm and stuff. Um, and I, I like the playbooks. Like the playbooks are fun. Like they they have moves that make me want to jump in and do cool stuff. So I'm I backed root hard, and I'm super excited to see what the final design looks like it's so pretty like they have so many cool art assets it's so pretty i love all the playbooks my partner rob looked at it and went every playbook is a rage character like you can take <laughs> any of these things and just run it into the ground and make it beautiful um i i did encounter a little bit of friction uh with the characters being funny animals or furries depending on how you want to call them i like it as someone who does have friends who are furries, I also like the idea that it removes the discussion about human society away from the game. So we can focus that lens in on talking about this is a story about a community that's been affected by generations of wars and conflicts and different ruling classes shifting in and shifting out. And we aren't looking at the granularity of who these people are because they're critters. And that, I think, lets everyone take a big step back. 
and go like, well, of course the cats and the birds are fighting, but let's talk about why they're fighting. Uh, what else have I been playing? So my two home games are uh, very interesting and different in tone. I've been playing Legacy Life Among the Ruins second edition since the summer. And that game is beautiful and also very complicated. And I don't mean to say that to scare people off from playing it. There are a lot of moving parts, but our party, pardon me, our party has bought in completely. And we spend a lot of time looking at fine details. I think I should take a step back because I've got a little bit of a, a tangent. So Legacy Life Among the Ruins is a game where you're playing, it's kind of like Microscope, I guess, in that you're playing your families who are trying to form your community in this post-apocalyptic world, but then you're also playing your player character who is a facet or a reflection of that family. And you have a role within the family that shifts depending on what choices you make. And then on a wider scale, your families are working towards creating wonders and also dealing with the world changing and the age changing and there being a loss of information, discovery of new information. Our group is so invested in the world. It's incredible. There was a giant plot twist recently where we discovered, oh, there was a giant grammatical error that was tied into one of the world's religions. So it wasn't the temple of the three mothers that everyone was fixated on this one temple. It was actually the temple of the third mother. And there were two more temples of secrets left to discover. And our last session, uh, our GM came in and said, so at the end of the session, the age is going to churn and it's going to churn because one of your families is going to create a wonder, or it's just going to churn without you all evolving on. So Figure out what you want to do because you know roughly what wonders you're interested in building and you figure out where to get these resources, but you're on a time limit. And it was this frantic dash of players trying to steal resources from each other, trying to make trades with each other, making alliances that shattered apart because of situations that developed. And it only got resolved at the last minute where we triggered the age of discovery because two of us were frantically passing a note back and forth because it was the only way to communicate at the table to negotiate a trade deal. It was incredible. I, <laughs> that sounds awesome. I don't think it's a game for all people though. I, I, in the same way, I don't think Microsoft or Microsoft microscope is a game that all people are going to enjoy. Like there is a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things to think about. But if you have a group that is willing to play around with each other's toys and be open to new ideas and open to exploring things, I think it's wonderful. Have you had a chance to play it yet, Rich? I played Legacy. I haven't tried Second Edition. Um, I, I may get the opportunity to play it soon, though, and I'm, I'm very excited to give it a shot. Yeah, go make sure you get the Order of the Titans so you too can summon giant monsters upon the wasteland. It is so much fun. Be like, yeah, a monster shows up. I tell you guys, but not you. So fucking deal with that shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not. It's They're not good people. Oh, like, oh, oh, I could talk about Legacy for days. Really? Oh man, this oh you got me so hyped for this. I mm, cannot wait oh, it's, to give it a shot. Yeah, it, it just like just everything is so evocative. Spend some time looking over your choices. I the, our last session, I think I'm done with my current play, player character, but all my player characters in my family are named after astronomers, <laughs> astrologers rather. Uh, and then I found a Taiwanese uh, scientist named Typhoon Lee, which sounds like it's a name someone made at the table, but it's an actual scientist. He has a Wikipedia page. And then it just became like this, the story about Typhoon Lee and how Typhoon Lee was ramping up to become a real player character next session. But right now they were a background character that kept showing up in all these shots. <laughs> so good. That's some, that's, that's some fun meta play there. I like that. So my last game, keeping an eye on the time, is uh, Monster of the Week. And we were talking about self-indulgent. Also a big fan, anime-wise, of the Fate franchise, which, go Google it. It'll be a long time to explain. But the important thing you need to understand is Fate loves to reinterpret itself with its same characters in different situations. And Rob turned to me once and said, could we do something like Fate does with its alternate universes where we play, I don't know, Monster of the Week 
instead of urban shadows. And we take two supporting characters. They're now the main characters and we recontextualize how all the NPCs would be if the world was tilted a little bit to the left. It's super goofy fun. It's very self-indulgent. Um, on my Twitter feed today, I posted, uh, Rob made a custom move to invoke the Sea of Leaves from Summerland in our next mystery. Uh, if any of you have played Summerland, it, it's like a whole thing. It's not a Powered by the Apocalypse game, but, and I don't know why the Sea of Leaves is going to be in a Powered by the Apocalypse game, but I'm excited to find out. Well, you got to play to find out, right? Well, we're going to have to wait till we have time to go play. <laughs> Sad uh, face. Uh -huh. Stop being busy. Oh, life is busy. <laughs> All right. Uh, we wanted to finish up this. Oh, we've gone a little long, but I'm I'm okay with it. We had this idea of a dream games pairings. Is that right? Do you so, want to do you want to talk about the dream games pairings, or do you want to go on to the second uh, topic? Looking at the let's time, go to the second topic. We'll cut it for time, and uh, if we blaze through with our uh, our second topic, then we can circle back around and do this crazy thing. But yeah, let's let's hit the second topic. Rach, what is our second topic? Okay, so on the movie night episodes, Rich and I have been talking about movies we've both seen and powered by the apocalypse games we're both fairly familiar with. These are usually movies and games we have a shared passion for. For the live stream, we decided to do a media swap. And the rules for the media swap are a little bit looser. So I gave Rich a movie at or a piece of media and a Powered by the Apocalypse game pairing. And then Rich gave me one as well. These aren't going to be as one-to-one -one or as deep a dive into ways that these the movie or the piece of media can inform how you run the game, rather than a discussion about what inspirations and what could be cool about watching this piece of media and helping you inspire you to go play this game afterwards. So not tightly one-to-one. -one. So Rich, what did you suggest to me to go watch and consider in terms of game? <laughs> so I, 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 this was heavily influenced by the fact that I was dealing with the day moves and the night moves of night witches at the time that we came up with this. And uh, I, I said, hey, I remember being on the clock, which is the way it feels in day moves to me, um, being on the clock as something that was a huge part of an early episode of Battlestar Galactica, the remake that was on the now redubbed Siffy channel um, episode uh, title of 33. I didn't realize, didn't realize until I went back and watched it that it's, it's like the first full episode when it went from the backdoor pilot miniseries to the full on show. I watched this on Amazon. Uh, Amazon Prime Video has the Battlestar Galactica series, and that's where I was able to watch it. I did watch it originally on Sci-Fi back when uh, it was originally aired. Yeah, in did... Canada, I think we had to pay for an episode. I don't remember if we used iTunes or if we used Google Play, but it was available. We just had to pay a small fee for it. Oh, that stinks. Okay. Yeah, All whatever. right. <laughs> wow it has literally been uh since the original airing and maybe a few months after when i got to rewatch it on sci-fi since i had watched this particular episode what did you think rage so i watched this once with rob years ago and i was admittedly a little bit grumpy uh because i had a bit of an axe to grind with the showrunner for Battlestar galactica for reasons we won't discuss here so understand i did not watch this episode in good faith like eight years ago when i tried to watch it uh i sat down to watch it and i'm like oh i know why rich wanted me to watch this episode because it is so the the premise of the episode is the the fleet is trying to outrun the Cylons who show up and attack every 33 minutes. So in every 33 minutes, the fleet has to retaliate and also jump forward, uh, do a hyperspace, a faster light jump uh, to make it to a new location. But every time they jump, the Cylons keep following. And at the time the episode starts, they've been doing this for over 130 hours, I think. Yeah, days. A lot, a lot. Days. 
the the crew is running on sleep deprivation. Uh, the pilots are hyped up, hopped up on stimulants. It creates all sorts of really interesting friction and tension between these characters because these characters are not operating at their best. They are super run down. They are super stressed out. These are not happy people for obvious reasons. And uh, I was thinking of the context of Night Witches because that was the parent game you gave me. Because I found when I played Night Witches, we didn't really focus... Well, for one, we were mostly playing one-shots and we didn't really focus on the grind. And that idea of the grind and the idea of routine and how devastating and harmful routine is, is really interesting. When I was rereading parts of Night Witches, it talks about a routine mission being uh, a successful wayfinding role and a successful uh, attack run with the note saying most missions are not routine, implying that things are going to go wrong. What I like about 33 is it presents the idea of you know, having the routine, having it be the exact same thing over and over and over in a loop that you can't escape from is hell. It's destructive. And thinking about in Night Witches, the idea of these characters will go into their daytime moves and thinking less about, okay, so what are you doing now that you're not a pilot? And thinking more about this is the opportunity for all those emotions that you had to keep locked up because you had to go out and do your goddamn job. They're able to flow out now. And in that I think would also influence there's the social role who name fleets me at the moment where you decide how you want to interact. There's a hooligan, a lady, or is a Soviet mm -hmm. air woman. Do you remember the name of that move? Act up. Act up. Yeah. Thinking about act up in terms of no, I would withhold that. I would do the right thing. I would make the right emotional choice at any given point in time. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You have to wake up in the middle of the night to go on a bombing run and you come back and like the base, like it's not a great space for you. It's a toxic, oppressive environment. You are going to act up in ways that are not going to be beneficial to you. I also really love like when uh, Lee gives his briefing run, which is like, you guys know already what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Just the context of GMs, just save that joke for when you're running Night Witches, because you're going to have a point of like, yeah, yeah, ladies, we know exactly what we're going to do. It's the same thing we've done every single night. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Rich, upon rewatching 33, was there anything that stood out to you, especially now that you have uh, run Night Witches, even in the Star Wars setting, but you have run it recently? Yeah, I have to say 33 is a great lens for a number of moves. Reaching out is something that happens a few different times as even the command staff, Adama and Ty, uh, they are getting worn down as well. Uh, there's a scene between the president and one of her assistants, um, between Starbuck and uh, 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 Apollo. Um, I you said his name just a moment ago. And it, Lee, Lee, um, and they're all different ways of how they relate. Like the confrontation when Lee is ordered give stems to the pilots because our FTL drives are not spinning up as quick. So this 33 minutes, you know, we're having trouble with some of the ships getting out. We're going to need to defend better with our pilots, that kind of thing. And Starbuck pushing back, Starbuck pushing back on Lee and forcing him to be a CAG, not a buddy was uh, it's just so good i think this was when Battlestar galactica was an incredibly amazing show to me it i fell off as it went on but th this is when the moments of the show were intense and unexpected and that was that was a great moment and i definitely saw it as ways that you can emulate that in night witches yeah, and I think overall, and I believe we may have mentioned it on the show proper before, there's not a lot of good examples of fighter pilot fiction to mm. refer back to right now. Like all the examples I can think of are novels and books that are several decades out of date. And this is, it's about 15 years old now, but it's still fairly recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, anything else you want to say about 33? No, I think that sums it up. I think it's a great starting point in terms of if you want to see how tensions uh, in Night Witches between the player characters and the player characters of the NPCs could play out. I think it's a good place to start for reference. 
All right, I'm going to talk about my pairing that I was assigned <laughs> now. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Rich. <laughs> Uh, Rach assigned me the Powered by the Apocalypse game, The Sprawl by Hamish. Uh, and The Sprawl, my experience with The Sprawl is Rich has played a lot of Shadowrun. And uh, and then there was that episode of Plus One Forward where I got a demo of it. Those are my experiences with The Sprawl. And the moving pairing... Um, you would think, oh, Blade Runner, right? Like Blade Runner? Maybe, maybe, uh, no, it's Thief from 1981, directed by Michael Mann, starring James Caan with actors such as Dennis Farina, uh, Jim Belushi uh, as James back. No, uh, yeah, yeah, James James Belushi, mm-hmm. not not uh, the famous SNL actor, but the other one who's an actor. Right. Yep, uh, Tuesday Weld. And it it's by Michael Mann uh, three years before Miami Vice came out. And uh, it's got music uh, from Tangerine Dream. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you. When you said Tangerine Dream and I started thinking of Lady Hawk and like other. Ta- no, no, no. I don't think Tangerine Dream did Lady Hawk, did they? Right. Uh, I mostly associate them with Sorcerer, who you yeah. and Sorcerer uses the music kind of for the same impact they're looking for in Thief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's what we would call now like synth wave style music. And I went into this thinking, "Fuck you, Rage. This is terrible. I'm gonna hate." Did this. you have a good time? <laughs> oh my god, yes. So uh, I watched this on Vudu, which is a Walmart-owned video rental service. You can watch it free with ads. And when I say ads, I mean the skinniest amount of ads, the same three fucking ads every 10 minutes, whether it's a good break for the movie or not. You're going to watch uh, a baby back uh, commercial from Applebee's and some kind of like hot glue commercial. It's terrible and awful. Uh, that's the price you pay is watching those godforsaken commercials. Do it. Um from the very first moment of this this movie, I was like, I am getting such a cyberpunk vibe off of this thing. Um, like, there's a shot of the moon, and it slowly tracks down, and it's an alleyway, and you see the fire escapes kind of creating this really interesting look. And then it comes down to the moon reflected in the puddles of water on the asphalt. And I'm like, damn it. I'm interested. Uh, so, I, see, Rach is smart, and she she did paragraphs worth of work on our Google Doc. I sat down and watched the movie and took eight <laughs> note cards worth of notes uh, on all of the plot. I would just say simply, James Caan plays uh, a character who is a thief. And if I were to stick him into the sprawl, he definitely has a playbook um, I'll, I'll just say off the top that his playbook, Rich Goes to the Last Page, was Frank. The character Frank would be an infiltrator because he has a number of moves. Uh, his partner is Barry, uh, the Belushi. Barry is a hacker. And, uh, and so the idea of it is it starts off with a heist. Um, you find out that he's a safe cracker. And he goes to uh, get a bunch of diamonds and it starts off And this game or this game movie is so interested in process. Like Michael Mann wants to teach you how you break into safes. Like that's what I really think his secret agenda is with this movie, because you see like this is the 80s. I'd forgotten how slow and how like deliberate the eighties movies could be. Um, so you see this break into a safe and they get out and there's a whole thing where they're like switching cars and changing clothes. And then he hands over the ice and he gives it to this guy at a diner and the guy's it's fixer. Right. And he gives it to his fixer. And this is obviously the move where he's like going to get paid. And he misses the role because uh, he finds out finds out later that uh, Gags, the name of his fixer, evidently owed some other guy a bunch of money. And that guy killed him, threw him out of a window before Frank, our, our protagonist, was able to get paid. So what does Frank do? 
Does he cry about it? No, no. He gets a gun. He goes into a regular office, like a regular day-to-day office. Got a whole secretarial pool and like salesmen at desks and everything. Says he's got a problem about some plate glass and goes back and threatens the dude with a gun saying, give me my money, bitch. And it was insane. Like he was intense. And, uh, And then this guy's like, Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and and the office, like, it's, just, it's totally regular office. So he, he the guy's like, I'm going to meet you in 24 hours, and you better give me my money. And then he leaves, and there's, like, a cool moment where he walks out with the gun still, brandishing the gun, and all the secretaries are like, whoa, <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> I'm covering you. Shut up. I don't care. Um, Willie Nelson is in this movie, and it's his best acting ever. He, pl- he has, like, one scene. He plays this guy named Okla, uh, whose real name is David, and he's this guy in the in prison. And there's totally this moment between. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, but like, oh no, it's, no, it's good, it's good. We'll it's talk live. about it. It's, it's live. Uh, so, um, he talks with David, and you can see this is his connection. Like, this is his touchstone. This is where he comes to kind of recharge his batteries to get a little bit of information. You find out later throughout the movie that David's the guy that when he was sent to prison, he, Frank, sent to prison. He's been in prison for like 11 years. David became kind of his foster father. Also taught him how about safe cracking. That's a thing you can learn in the joint. It's how to be a better criminal, you know? Uh, so David's main thing is like, hey, I've got... I've got heart problems. I'm not going to make it. I've got 10 months of my sentence. I'm going to die in here unless you get me out. So there's the pressure, right? That's what Frank needs to solve for. So he goes and he meets up with this, uh, this guy to get paid. But then this other dude shows up and he's like a big wig. And he's like, yo, here's your money. Who hands it over? And you're like, wait, I want GM heart move with this. And Frank takes the money <laughs> and guys like, Hey, so here's the deal. I got a bunch of other jobs that you could do for me. And Frank thinking of David's like, all right, what's this fucking job? And he's like, no, no, no. It's like a thing. And you'll like work for me. And it's got this whole setup of like, and I'll get you into property and like, you know, shopping centers and all this good stuff. It's great. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Let's just do this one job. Cause he's got to do this job. Right. So then we go over, over a series of time, like there's a good half of the movie where it is like the way that Michael Mann directs this movie is the way that you need to GM. Like his scenes are so not always, but like this is a great way to GM. His scenes are tight, they're focused. Like, this is the scene where you meet the girl that is the girl of your dreams. Go. And you don't it's it's so economical and it's so efficient. And bam, he meets a girl. They they kind of fall in love. They learn about his backstory. Then they get married. He's going on this new heist and he's doing research. He's got to find out about like the fifth alarm and all these other alarms he's got to figure out. And uh, and Jim Belushi's off and he's like the NPC hacker who's doing all this, figuring out how to get the fifth alarm figured out. Meanwhile, he's dealing with like the day-to-day life of trying to be out of the joint and also taking care of Oakla and, and getting him his day in court. And Tuesday wants to have a kid, so they have to go like adopt and because she can't have a kid. And then they go, and that's the scene where she goes, he goes in, and she's like, uh, the lady's interviewing them, and she's so, uh, what is this here where you worked a certain penitentiary? What did you do for the penitentiary? And he's like, I made license plates. And she's like, what? He goes, I was in the joint, okay? I'm an ex-con. She's like, oh, well, I'll mark you off the list. And, yeah, and like, you showed up to my desk with all these red flags. I'm not giving you a child. Exactly. I'm not going to give you a child. Then he freaks out, and you learn like a little bit more about Oh, Frank's from a broken home and like, wow, his life sucks a lot. Then big, big wig guy comes in. He's like, you want a baby? I'll get you a baby. That's fine. No problem. I can hook you up. I know some women who want to get rid of their babies. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I, I love the reaction from, from fixer guy. Uh, if I remember his name is Leo. Leo's like, don't blame it on the kid. That these wives are a piece of shit. Or these mothers are a piece of shit. Like, the kid don't know. They're babies. And so Frank's like, all right, fine. I'll go buy this baby from a woman. <laughs> so he goes and picks up a baby. And I'm like, what? This is insane. This is crazy. <laughs> they buy a baby halfway through the movie. You buy know a baby. Movie. It involves a baby being purchased. <laughs> like, all of a sudden, there's a scene with him and uh, and Jesse, who's played by Tuesday Weld, his wife. And, and they're like, the guy comes by. They're a Chinese restaurant. And the guy's like, what's the baby's name? And he goes, I don't know yet. And <laughs> like, 
<laughs> his name David after Okla. And so they they'd like David gets out of uh, David Okla, the the mentor, Will Willie Nelson, uh, he gets out of prison. Uh, but you find out about this when he gets a desperate call and he goes to the hospital and you're like, oh my God, it's about the baby. No, it's David. So you go in and, oh, there's Willie Nelson. They're like, awesome. We're having a cool new scene with Willie Nelson, like my favorite character. He whispers into Frank's ear and he dies. He has no this discernible line. Like he just dies. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> Willie Nelson was good in this. Why did they give him some more lines? But, but no, the GM was not going to allow David to have any oh, more scenes. It was a hard that. move. It was a hard move, Rich. <laughs> it was a hard move. So, um, uh, let me skip ahead. I swear, but this movie is really good. You should totally watch it. Uh, so he finds out everything that he needs to know about getting this uh, heist done. And he does the heist and he gets all the diamonds and it's amazing. And then he hands over the stuff to Leo and everything's bright. He's got a kid. He's got a wife. They go off the, to let things cool off him and Barry and Barry, his, his partner, the hacker and Barry's girlfriend, Marie and Jesse and the baby. They're all out like to some place in San Diego and they're at the beach and it's gorgeous. He comes back to get paid from Leo. Leo hands him a big envelope of money. And you're like, all right, man, this worked out great. Everything. King Busters, and uh, he looks in. Frank looks in. He's like, um, "The I'm expecting like four hundred thousand, and this is eighty thousand. What's up?" And Leo's like, "Hey, remember I told you about all those properties? Yeah, I got you all the properties, man. You got like in Jacksonville or like in Florida. You got the shopping center, and you got this other thing. Like you're in now. You're part of us." And he's like, "Frank says, um, obviously I have failed my role to get paid, uh, so I am going to give you one chance." to to pay me and and then he says the most weird threat he says you got 24 hours to get me my money or i'm gonna wear your ass for a hat <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like what does it even mean so that's when everything goes to shit um barry gets murdered uh and and there's threats galore and as uh leo's thugs are getting rid of barry's body in front of frank they have guns in his face and he's like leo says frank i own you um you're mine i gave you your kid i gave you your wife you gave me no respect and it's like oh my god this is the worst like this is going to be the sad it's like the end of the shield where where a bad guy gets bad thing happening and and here we're almost done uh here's the point where frank proves that he is insane he he pulls out a box from his closet and hands it to jesse and his wife and says here's four hundred thousand dollars i have called a friend he is coming to pick you up take our son david who i have only known for a brief period of time and leave me get out of my house he kicks her out she drives away he burns down his house Oh, yes. Then he goes to the car lot that he owned before any of this happened. He pours gasoline on all the cars and burns them down. Then he goes to Leo's house. He beats up one of Leo's thugs. He gets in a gun battle with Leo. Leo's an old dude. He gets shot the hell up. Then he, on his way out, he shoots up all of Leo's people, kills all of them. And then, like, as they're lying dead in these nice and manicured lawns with really cool shrubbery and everything, Tantry Dream comes up and he just walks away. They're like, that's the end. He was wearing a bulletproof vest. I know, also, right. I think he, he blows he, up the timer at one point, too. Like, he blows up all, he burns down or oh, blows up right, right, yeah. properties. That's right. The green cove or green mill or whatever, yeah. they'd all, he blows that up. He torches everything. He's just like, I'm not just mad. Like I'm going after every contact that we have ever had, Leo. And he does all that first before he comes for Leo. It was vicious. I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. I can't believe that this movie is this good. So um, to tie it in the last few seconds. To the <laughs> So getting paid could be really a problem, especially if you fail. And this is how the movie could show you getting paid is the worst part of doing crime. Um, the As the infiltrator, uh, Frank, let's see, he had the moves of um, 
uh, covert entry because he pulled that <laughs> off big time. He had the move cat burglar because with the move cat burglar, uh, you specialize in infiltrating unconventional access points and maneuvering through locations by unconventional routes. He so did that. Case the joint. That was like a third of the movie. Um, and, and then the last scene of the movie was uh, him buying the move plan B when shit hits the fan. He has to get out, name your escape route and roll. Cool. And, uh, 10 plus sweet. You're gone. <laughs> his, his escape route was kill all of them and leave. <laughs> <laughs> and he rolled boxcars. Uh, so the thief uh, with James Khan, watch it. And uh, wow. It is really sprawly. Like, holy shit, Rach, you are on the money. Yeah, the, the reason I, I brought it up as an example are, well, two reasons. One, it is the ultimate example of someone botching their getting paid role over and over and over again. Frank cannot roll on that move to save his goddamn life. Nope. It's just he's always failing. He also has, like, a, there's a third thing I'd like to go back to. But the second one is I do want to put a little attention towards it's not cyberpunk, but it's got a lot of the trappings of cyberpunk. It has some very, very sexily shot pieces of equipment. When they do the big safe cracking up to the climax of the movie, there is no tension in that if they're going to get in or not. It's like, hey, we have an oxygen lance. Do you want to see a really cool oxygen lance for five minutes? And I'm like, yes, yes, I would like to see an oxygen lance. Oh, my God, it's bigger than I thought, which also <laughs> said healthy. You know, they describe it like that. But it's just it's it's about this is the sexy tech you have and this is what makes it cool like it's that whole rule of cool thing that we have with technology and cyberpunk with all of the terrible trappings that go along with it uh the third is i do think frank is an interesting example of a cyberpunk character you didn't mention he basically has a vision board he keeps carrying around with him with like cutouts of everything he wants his best possible future to be yeah and it's it's a very human um drive to for like this person who is a criminal as a history of criminal activity who still has like i have a dream for the future here is it reflected in a bunch of newspaper clippings i keep it in my back pocket so i remember what my goal is and to think of that in the context of your sprawl or veil or uh i haven't really played headspace but your characters like that they're still a human even if they're despicable people they have wants and dreams they're in the criminal life simply for the thrill of it they probably want something out of it and that could be pretty simple as much as like getting your mentor out of jail before he dies of heart failure yeah yeah wow thanks rach like legit thanks for for assigning that movie to me uh it was such a, a head snatch of like this movie's gonna be terrible and like nope Nope, this is the best thing James Conn's ever done, and Tangerine Dream can actually make a soundtrack that makes me fall in love with Tangerine Dream's music, and wow. It, it, is, uh, it is definitely, like, I, I know it's, like, something that people would look at it and go, like, well, there's a lot of red flags. Uh, there should be, like, a parade of content warnings before this movie, so you might want to kind of look into the content if you're someone who does have specific triggers, because it is it is not a subtle movie. It's a pretty vicious movie. Uh, mm. I... I enjoy films that are, I would say, films full of existential dread from this time period. And this, like, hits all my buttons in the right way. So I love this shit, like, totally into it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. It Thank might you not for bringing up the, the, the content. Is, it is harsh. Like, it's pretty harsh. Um, I mean, Dennis Farina gets killed. So, you know, that's sad. Well, how they get rid of uh, Belushi's body is pretty horrific. I was oh, like, oh, wow. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and I didn't even mention Sam, the like metallurgist, who's like the coolest contact NPC I've seen in forever. Oh he yeah, so he's great. super cool. Yeah, he's like. Uh, so, uh, do you have anything else you wanted to say about uh, anything we've talked about tonight? <laughs> Uh, no, other than I really love doing this media swap. I feel we both got something out of it. Uh, and I'm excited for our next movie night podcast. That's going to be what, whatever our topic is. I don't think we've decided yet. We haven't. We've got it. We've got a short list, as it were. But uh, damn, I really like these like short ones too. This was great. Uh, thank you so much, Rach, for suggesting this particular topic. It was fun. yeah. Maybe we'll do like another little swap in the future. Things that aren't quite right for a deep dive, but might be interesting to uh, pay some attention to and follow up over. 
Absolutely. Well, Blake, SL, uh, Patrick, and Heidi, thank you all for giving us some comments as we talked along uh, with this live episode of Plus One Forward. Uh, it's actually quicker to get this one out. I won't have to edit the crap out of it, Rach. What am I going to do with all that extra time, quote unquote? <laughs> we have we have a backlog of lots of exciting interviews that are not time sensitive for you all to look forward to in the next few months. I think That's we have right. stuff until like Christmas. At this we point. do. We have stuff till Christmas. I think the present is that Rich will take a break or maybe pass out. Thank <laughs> you all so much for listening and watching. Rach, thank you. It's been a pleasure, and we will bring this to a close. Yeah. Thank you again, Rich. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community Richard Rogers and Rach Schalke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Hammer of Bill. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com.